Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us and uh, meeting Codex today. Uh, many of you have met Codex before, but you might be interested in hearing from uh, our fellows about their research. Uh, so welcome, it's really great to have you here. My name is Roland Vogel, I'm Executive Director of Codex. And I think I have to stand here actually for the audio, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to kind of MC this event. I will just give a, a very brief introduction about what, uh, what Codex is, um, and then talk about a few market trends, um, and talk about the significance of technology uh, to our legal system. And then I will turn it over to, uh, to our fellows who will introduce their, their work to you. And uh, I think what we'll do is we'll let everyone speak for about uh, seven minutes or so, and then maybe take uh, one question, if there's a question regarding um, the fellows project, and then uh, keep about 10 minutes at the end uh, for people to, to ask um, more questions. All right, so Codex, sorry. So Codex is uh, a joint center between the Stanford Law School and the Computer Science Department. Uh, we are a research center, but we are also uh, more than just a research center. We've been uh, kind of building a, an innovation network around the center, an ecosystem of early stage innovation in uh, legal technology. Uh, our mission is to research and develop technologies that make the legal system more efficient for all stakeholders in the legal system. Uh, our motto is legal empowerment through information technology. So there's a lot happening in legal technology and new ideas are coming you know, from you know, all different kinds of directions. We've kind of developed um, you know, three kind of categories that help us uh, kind of make sense and organize uh, the field a little bit. Um, so we see projects in, uh, in these three areas. So one is legal information retrieval where we use computers to get to the legal information uh, in a quicker, faster, and cheaper way. But the computer really doesn't, doesn't understand uh, how to mechanize or automate uh, that legal information. It's just there to help the human lawyer uh, get to the legal information. Then projects in uh, legal in infrastructure, so those are projects that bring together the stakeholders in the legal system and connect the stakeholders new ways. So an example of that would be, uh, you know, these new marketplaces that connect lawyers with, uh, with clients um, and also new kind of prax uh, practice management tools, that sort of thing. Oh, sorry, I keep pacing around. So, Thank you. so um, and the other category, and that's really the focus area of our center, is uh, computational law. And uh, computational law is pretty much, you see that? Jesus, um, sorry for that. Computational law is um, uh, the area of legal informatics that's concerned with uh, the automation and mechanization of, of legal analysis. And there are two, um, sorry, now my, my slideshow has to stop. Uh, give me a second. So there are two, sorry, there are two um, approaches to uh, computational law. So there are those that, that leverage, you know, logic-based and rule-based systems, you know, the old school AI. And then there are those that leverage um, statistical AI, natural language processing and machine learning uh, to, to kind of advance the data analytics um, and uh, predictive analytics and, you know, to predict legal outcomes. And uh, that's really sort of, you know, the, the focus area of, of, of Codex. Um, these three approaches, they, they, they're not mutually exclusive. They can, you know, kind of work together and leverage each other's strength. Uh, but, um, yeah, so that's kind of how we organize the field. Codex has also been uh, 
uh, a hotbed for uh, early stage legal tech innovation. We've been called the vortex for legal tech. Uh, several, sorry. So I'll use this now. So several uh, startups came out of legal, um, out of um, Stanford Law School. Um, and some of which had, um, you know, the Codex uh, Fellows as their founders. Um, uh, Lex Machina, Professor Lemley's brainchild, is really the first uh, startup that came out of um, out of Stanford Law School. Can you, can you get those two back? Oh. To help with this thing. Um, then there's Cipix, is another uh, startup that came out of um, Codex. Um, Ravel, of course. Um, Legal.io, Tony's company, Case Text, uh, Pablo is uh, VP of Research at, at Case Text, and many others, and uh, and so we've been uh, also you know been kind of recognized as really one of the uh, the most exciting places uh, for legal tech uh, early stage innovation, and we're quite proud of it. So I keep showing that that slide. So. Uh, all right, so there's been, uh, for some of you who might be uh, one else uh, and, and uh, kind of new to the legal services industry, uh, there's been um, a kind of a uh, kind of a slowing of, um, or sort of a flattening of demand for legal services in, in recent years. And that is due to the fact that, you know, law firms now, and you only see half of those, uh, law firms now, um, you know, find sort of the the, the, the marketplace is uh, is much more fragmented than it used to be. There's a lot of new competitors on the market. The big law firms are you know competing with uh, regional law firms, boutique law firms, also with corporate legal departments that are insourcing more and more legal work. Legal tech companies, legal legal process outsourcing companies, alternative legal service providers. And so it's a very oh thank you, a very uh, Kind of different market, um, and legal tech innovation is is growing in importance. It's been growing in in importance. Um, hey, uh, Dave, Dave, can we make this kind of kind of get this thing out of the screen? Thank you. So, um, and we see a lot of innovation uh, across different areas of legal legal tech. So, search, uh, big data, computational law that I already mentioned, practice management online dispute resolution. And uh, well now this thing is not working anymore. <laughs> Did you? There's something's kind of blocking. Yeah, I'll just use this. I use this thing. This is, this is where I'll just do it from here. So, and so some commentators have basically said, well, if as a, as a law firm of lawyers that, you know, that fall behind on technology, they run the risk of commercial ruin. And that axiom applies not only to law firms, but also to uh, law schools that want employers to hire uh, their graduates. All right, so we've been really kind of trying to cover this early stage innovation in legal tech. Uh, one of the things we've done is to create a database that, uh, that tracks those company, companies um, innovating in that space. And we have over 700 30 companies already in that, that database. Um, and uh, so one of the things, you know, before I conclude, one of the things I wanted to kind of uh, also raise as an interesting uh, topic is sort of the specter of the robo-lawyer. And uh, that's sort of a concept that's become more and more covered in the media, the robo-lawyer. And, um, and, you know, sort of the kind of cognitive decision-making abilities of the robo-lawyer that make lawyers quite uncomfortable because they feel like, okay, well, uh, there's all these companies out there and they're going to take my job away. The robo-lawyer has sort of like a computational law, has two aspects to it. So one is that of legal process automation uh, and, you know, kind of the, the turbo-taxing different areas of the law. Uh, and there's examples, um, you know, other areas where where this approach can be leveraged, you know, computable contracts is, uh, is one area. There's a lot of excitement about computable contracts on the blockchain currently in particular. Um, there is also uh, this area of predicting legal outcomes um, that I mentioned already. 
that's enabled by uh, natural language processing and machine learning. And that really has become uh, something that lawyers are, you know, so the ability to predict legal outcomes is what lawyers have traditionally viewed as being, you know, their, their domain, and it's based on their many years of experience that they can counsel their, their clients and tell them, okay, well, you're likely to succeed in a particular matter or not. Um, companies that were until recently uh, promoting their services as legal robot services have somewhat kind of dialed back that rhetoric because they found it kind of hard to sell their services to lawyers when they call them robo-lawyers. So they now call them uh, data-driven decision-making tools rather than uh, legal prediction tools. But it goes back to that question, you know, of like, are these services legal enhanced? Like, are they sort of uh, lawyer enhancing or are they lawyer replacing uh, services? All right, so from our perspective, we feel very strongly about uh, the fact that every lawyer needs to know at least the basic of legal informatics. And so we do a number of things to, to educate lawyers um, and uh, aspiring lawyers about legal informatics. So first and foremost, uh, for our students, we offer a class on legal informatics. It will be offered again in the spring of uh, next year. We do tons of events. Um, our flagship program is the Codex Future Law Conference that will be on April 5th uh, next year. We have a monthly speaker series, um, and uh, we also have uh, weekly group meetings where we bring in interesting <laughs> researchers and, uh, and startups to talk about uh, their innovations. Um, and so you should uh, sign up for our mailing list if you're interested in participating in those uh, meetings. All right, so that's my, my quick overview. Um, I'm going to turn it over to who's, who's going to be next time. Okay, Brian, come up. Are there any questions so far? No? All right, so let's turn it over to Brian. Can I use this? And Probably not. No? Why? Why? Your, if you have this for here. Then. Yeah, I'm going to use this one. It's right in front of me. And now, can you see if this is on? No, it's in the wrong okay. place. All right, uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Casey. I'm a 3L here at the law school, a uh, uh, Codex non-residential fellow. And um, because the project that I'm working on in the very strictly legal informatics sense is still currently under wraps, uh, we're instead gonna take a little bit of a detour and talk more about the robo-lawyer aspects of uh, where the legal informatics field is going. Um, so today we are going to talk about some of my recent work on robotics, robotics engineering, and the moral implications that flow from artificial intelligence systems navigating the real world. And like every conversation about robots these days, we're going to begin with the trolley problem. Um, so has anyone here heard of the trolley problem? Okay, great. We're getting some hits. All right. So the trolley problem is a famous moral thought experiment that goes like this. Imagine... Uh, a trolley is hurtling towards a cluster of five people who are standing on the tracks facing certain death. And you're at a switch watching this unfold. <coughs> and by throwing the switch, you can divert the trolley to a different track where only one person is standing currently out of harm's way, but certain to die because of your actions. So should you throw the switch, cutting the death toll from five to one? Um, quick poll, who would throw the switch, cutting the death toll from five to one? All right, some, some utilitarians among us. OK, great. <laughs> OK, so now let's tweak the variable slightly with a famous follow-up to the trolley problem. Oh, sorry about that. So imagine you're at that same runaway trolley scenario, but this time you're standing on a bridge next to, uh, pardon the uh, non-politically correct version of this, uh, a fat man. And you see a trolley coming, and you know you, could fin you know you could push that fat person off the bridge onto the tracks, and it would simultaneously stop the trolley. Um, that would also save the five from dying, but in this scenario, show of hands, how many would push the fat person off the tracks to save the five? 
a real utilitarian among us. Okay, great. A couple hands, a couple hands. Um, okay, so about a decade ago, Google began pioneering self-driving cars. Um, and people and people started to realize that we were on the cusp of having robots that would actually be confronted with these kind of decisions. Um, and the difference in the responses to the fat man scenario and the traditional trolley car problem show that uh, these are really difficult moral questions for us, but unlike humans, which may never encounter these actual scenarios in real life, engineers of these systems are gonna have to program them prospectively. Um, and so, about a decade ago, a bunch of academics went to work on this, and one of the pivotal works in this place was Wendell Wallach's publication called Moral Machines. Um, and it has since been joined by a bunch of preeminent scholars um, who have basically made statements along these lines, and I'll just do the 100 mile per hour version. Um, in the future, moral philosophy will be a key industry sector. Um, you'll have to get your ethical values loaded into your robots by philosophical values companies and that sort of thing. Um, and how many of you in the audience would sort of basically agree with what these scholars are saying? That um, these values are gonna get loaded in and they're gonna be in a deep moral and ethical sense um, foundational. All right, a few hands, a few hands. Okay, so, um, Basically, um, I'm gonna spend the rest of this presentation showing you why that's probably not gonna be the way things unfold. Um, so, economic analysis of law teaches us that um, legal rules have effects on behavior. Um, and if we go back to the trolley car scenario again, but this time we're Google's engineers and our driverless car is driving down the, hang on a second and our driverless car is cruising down the road when suddenly a man dashes out in front of it, our system it might be confronted with a similar choice. It can either hit the man or veer onto the sidewalk and hit five women and children. And so what do you think these engineers are gonna do prospectively? So does anyone have an idea of which direction the engineers would probably aim their car? Toward the man coming across. And why do you think that they're gonna do that? Right, right, so they're not gonna ask themselves what would Socrates do in this situation, what would Kant do in this situation, what would Aristotle do in this situation. They're gonna ask themselves who's negligent and why are they doing that? Because it's cheaper. Um, and so if the engineers choose the alternatives, the estates of all these dead pedestrians are gonna sue Google and then just imagine the engineers getting called to testify and saying, well, I read this really convincing argument by Aristotle, and so I elected to save the man instead. Um, and so, right, that's how our legal system works. Liability for accidents is governed by tort law, and not moral law. And what that means is exactly the kind of distinction that Holmes tried to call uh, uh, almost 100 years ago. So you can get people to act morally by using a carrot and stick approach. Uh, of legal incentives, regardless of whether they actually feel those moral intuitions at their core. And so, in 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 situations where the law is less clear, um, what's been ha what's be been beginning to happening in the robotic space is that um, patents have emerged that um, that look at this from a sort of risk management perspective. Um, and in Google, in 2014, Google patented a, um, uh, a, a process for how an automated vehicle might optimize its own safety by positioning itself slightly closer to smaller vehicles as it passed them on the highway. And by moving the smaller vehicle, the automated car has decreased the overall risk but is now unfairly distributing it. And should this, why should the small car have to take on more risk? And if you look at this risk redistribution on a formalized sense at a high enough scale, it actually looks like the trolley car scenario. And so what the engineers have begun to do in this space is they've looked at each potential outcome, they've assigned a likelihood to it as well as a positive and negative event magnitude, and then they multiply those magnitudes by the likelihood and the resulting values can be summed. And if the benefits outweigh the costs from the, per from the company's perspective, uh, then the vehicle can be expected to execute the least costly 
uh, action. And so do any 1Ls or 2Ls have an idea of what this sort of looks like from a legal perspective? Is it beginning to ring any bells? Maybe you haven't gotten to that part in torts yet. Okay, so um, it looks like the hand formula. Um, so this is a famous formula for defining negligence formulaically um, that was originated almost 100 years ago uh, by a really famous American jurist. And so what's gonna happen is these numbers are gonna be informed not by morality but by legal outcomes. You might have different legal outcomes pointing in different directions in different jurisdictions and it means that a car might cross the border between Virginia and Maryland and have a completely different risk aversion in this space if the laws are likely to have completely different economic outcomes. And so what does that mean? Well, you're not gonna have Socrates sitting behind the wheel. Um, engineers are gonna design their robots to view the world not as good philosophers, but as bad men, concerned less with ethical rules than with avoiding being made to pay money and keep out of jail. And so instead of being moral machines, they're actually going to look like amoral machines. <laughs> and is this the dismal science at work again? You can't really, s you, can't, you can't see the title of this slide, but we'll see if I can. So is this the dismal science at work again, or is there any cause for optimism here? Well, what it means is that the true engineers of robotics morality are not gonna be the cloistered engineering teams of Google and Tesla and Uber. It's gonna be d democracies and their stakeholders. So if you think that it went the wrong way in a particular trolley car scenario, or it should be behaving differently in other situations, then you need to talk to your congressperson, not Google's self-driving car engineers. And so next time you see one of these articles talking about how we have to figure out human morality before we can bring autonomous vehicles on the road, you can tell your friends, those reporters just don't understand law and economics. <laughs> and so, um, this paper is in Northwestern uh, Law Review right now. It got covered by Wired Magazine, uh, and it's called Amoral Machines or How Roboticists Can Learn to Stop Worrying and Love the Law, uh, if anyone wants to check it out. Did you uh, put the presentation up yet? Yeah. Which one is it? The, um, the back one. Oh, no, the, the, no. Okay. Um, What's that? Oh, I saw it actually. That was up there. Great. Um, hey everyone, my name is Ashton, and I am a master's student in the uh, computer science department here at Stanford. Um, so today I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about a project that I worked on last spring <coughs> that involved uh, applying machine learning, which is sort of what I work on, to one of the classic problems in the legal space. Great, so I don't have a ton of time today, obviously, we're running pretty pretty quick, but uh, I'm gonna try to keep this pretty high level. I'm gonna gloss over a lot of the technical details as a result, but I made sure to leave a little bit of buffer time. So if you have any questions, please just feel free to, to shout them out. Great, so let me just start by setting the context for what I was working on at a pretty high level. 
I'm sure I probably don't need to tell the vast majority of the folks in, room, in this room anything about this, but uh, when making arguments, lawyers use precedents to support the arguments that they're making. And they need to make sure when they do that that the precedents they're actually using are still valid and have not been subsequently overturned. Because if they have been, that basically just tanks their argument. So as a result, they need a way to determine whether or not any given precedent that they may want to cite has been subsequently overturned or whether it's still, in fact, holds, holds water, which is what they want. And there's no super easy way to get this information. To independently determine whether or not a given precedent is still valid, what you would have to do is effectively read pretty much every judicial opinion produced by any appellate court and make sure that none of them are mentioning a negative treatment of the precedent that you want to cite. But fortunately, there are products out there in the market that have sort of done the heavy lifting for lawyers and have put in the time to do all that reading and as a result just surface that information to lawyers pretty easily. This is a great solution. Pretty much every lawyer, or a lot of you as lawyers at least, use these solutions. So what's the real problem? The problem is pretty simple and it's just that they're very, very expensive. The products are super expensive. And they're very expensive because the way that they are created is that the companies that produce those products employ teams of individuals whose full-time job it is to every day come into work and just read through pretty much every judicial opinion that is produced by appellate courts and identify the cases in which they're identifying negative treatments to any of the cases they cite. And what this means is that the lawyers at the big fancy law firms have no problem accessing these services. They can totally afford them. But unfortunately, the lawyers at many of the smaller law firms or potentially individual practitioners just don't have the funds to actually pay for those super expensive services. And as a result, they actually pretty much just end up flying blind in a lot of cases where they don't actually know whether the precedents that they're citing and the arguments that rely on those precedents are actually valid. And what this means, unfortunately, is that their clients ultimately end up paying the price because when their lawyers make an argument that doesn't hold up in court, they're the ones who end up um, paying the cost of that misstep. So the goal of my work was basically to find another way around this problem, to basically automate the task of identifying negative treatments and judicial opinions so that rather than having uh, people whose time is very expensive do the work of identifying all those negative treatments, uh, instead a machine could just do it for a very small fraction of the cost. And obviously the benefit of this would be that the service that produces the resulting information would be much cheaper and the accessibility of those services would be much larger. I actually was not the first person to look at this problem though, unsurprisingly. Um, a company called Fastcase originally built an interesting product also aiming at solving the exact same problem. And they came up with a pretty elegant and pretty simple solution. They leveraged the observation that the Blue Book actually mandates that when mentioning citations, uh, a judge in a judicial opinion must say whether or not that citation has been negatively treated. And if it has been, what they have to do is express the fact that it's been negatively treated and may not be valid anymore in a very, very specific way. And that's the catch. Uh, judges that mention negatively treated citations must mention the fact that they have been negatively treated in a super, super structured way. And in particular, what they have to do is they first mention the citation they're trying to mention. They then use one of the explanatory phrases that appear in the uh, table to the right hand of the slide. Um, and then they mention the citation of the case that was doing the negative treating of the former citation. So for example, uh, you can see uh, in the screenshot on the left hand side of the slide, uh, for instance, one of the statements is Ohio v. Roberts citation abrogated by Crawford v. Washington citation. And so the benefit of the fact that these negative treatments are mentioned in a super structured way is the, wow, looks mm -hmm. like I'm running really short on time. The benefit is the fact that the fast case is basically able to employ a solution that just uses regular expressions, super deterministically extracting negative citations. But the problem with the solution is that it only is able to extract a very small percentage of negative citations overall, less than 5% roughly. So while it's able to do so super accurately, it's not a comprehensive solution. So I'm going to, at 100 miles per hour, just go over my solution because I'm running apparently shorter on time than I expected. Um, my solution starts by using the uh, actually super useful bad law bot insight that you're able to extract a bunch of citations with perfect accuracy in a certain way. And the reason this is useful is that every machine learning system requires a training set. And in machine learning classes, the professor always gives you the training set and tells you to basically just build a solution using that training set. And that's super cool and super interesting. But the problem, and one that is very, very irritating to folks, folks like me, is that in the real world, uh, the training set that you want and that you need almost never exists. 
So one of the biggest challenges in creating a machine learning system is always identifying that training set to begin with. And the perfect training set for my solution was the out output of bad lava. So I'm not going to go into all the gory details, but really quickly at a high level, the goal of my machine learning system was to identify whether any given sentence in a judicial opinion expressed a negative treatment or not. And in particular, what it would do would be to take as input a judicial opinion, iterate over all the sentences therein, and in a binary way classify each sentence as either expressing a negative treatment or not doing so. It's a binary classification task. And the idea was basically to take a bunch of sentences that via bad lava had been identified as actually containing negative treatments, then take a bunch of randomly selected sentences that did not contain negative treatments, and basically train an actual classification model to learn the attributes that differentiated these sentences that did contain negative treatments from those that did not. So that's it. Very, very simple. Uh, a little bit more complicated uh, under the hood. But I'll just really quickly uh, speak. <laughs> Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> okay, right on. That was great. <laughs> I think that actually might have been a positive uh, addition to this presentation. But anyway, um, really quickly, just to wrap this up, I'll, uh, I'll speak to how well the system actually worked and how it actually did. Uh, so there are two metrics that typically measure the performance of machine learning systems. There's precision and recall. Precision, uh, in this case, would be the percentage of all the negative treatments that the system identified that were actual negative treatments. And recall would be the percentage of all negative treatments that the system was able to identify. Uh, the system had about an 89% precision and an 18% recall. In a vacuum, that might not mean much, but I'll compare those numbers to bad Lobot's numbers really quickly just to give a flavor of what they actually mean. And so like I mentioned, bad Lobot, Lobot is actually perfectly accurate in the treatments that it does identify. So its precision was actually just 100%. But its recall was less than 5%, uh, so that's significantly worse. Um, so yeah, overall, uh, this system performed a little bit better in some ways and a little bit worse than others. Uh, it has about a 10% larger error rate, but was able to identify about 16 times more negative treatments than bad lava was able to. So it's a trade-off, and it's obviously still not perfect, uh, but it's a work in progress. And I guess my hope is that after a few more iterations and after a few more accuracy milestone improvements, that this will get closer to actually solving the accessibility problem in this space. So sorry I went over time, but thank you guys for listening. Just open one. up Chrome. No, I don't have slides. I just have the, the platform itself. Casetext.com. Real quick. Okay, this thing's got to go. You won't let me do it. Okay. Bear with me, guys. I just got to log in. Okay, that works. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Pablo Arredondo. I'm a fellow at Codex, and uh, my new title, I guess, is Chief Legal Research Officer. At Case Text, I think I'm the only chief legal research officer in the country, which means I'm one of the best that you're going to find. Uh, <laughs> my background, uh, I worked as a patent litigator uh, at Kirkland & Ellis in uh, San Francisco and then at Quinn Emanuel in New York. And one of the first cases I worked on was a litigation for Apple. And I had this daydream that Steve Jobs was going to come check on all the associates and see how we were doing, which he never did. And I thought, well, I don't want to offend Mr. Jobs, so I should buy a Mac, right? I was a PC guy up until that point. And this is 2006 when he was having his whole renaissance, right? So then I see this beautiful new thing he created, and then I look back to the tools that I'm using to represent his company, right? Westlaw. This is before Westlaw Next, even. Lexus. And essentially, it struck me that we were using very bad technology to represent these very good technology companies. And these were, you know, nine-figure patent litigation, so it wasn't like money was an object, right? This is the best stuff we could buy, and it's still, um, basically, I hated it. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's been some improvements since then. Westlaw came out with a new product, but it's too late. I'm already enraged. So now I've been putting my shoulder to legal tech since 2010, and uh, there's two things I just love to see grow. Uh, uh, one is venture capitalist dollars dedicated to it, and the other one is students uh, and folks like you coming to the Codex event. Um, and I been to think that we have people in the back uh, behind the actual chairs. Uh, it was not like that uh, nine years ago. So I'm really encouraged. 
All right, so uh, what is it that uh, I'm up to that I think is going to be so great for legal research? Well, one of the many things that I hated about Westlaw and Lexis, um, uh, although they do some great things like sponsor Codex, so you know they're good, but <laughs> one, one, uh, one, of the, the, one of the things I found puzzling about Westlaw and Lexis was that the platform didn't take account of what your context was, right? If I was an attorney in uh, Washington doing a tort case and I typed the word damages, I would get the same list back as a patent attorney in Florida who typed the word damages, right? Clearly we wanted very different things and yet the results would be the same. And the response would be like, well listen, that's why we invented very long Boolean queries, right? You can type and this and that and within five and not that and all of these things. And it was on us to try to create the context by doing these long Boolean strings. And you feel fancy when you learn to do that in law school. You're like, look at me, I can do it, I'm a lawyer, right? But the problem is, is that all the literature suggests that every time you're doing those, you're being both over and under-inclusive, right? You're both losing things that you would want and you're getting a bunch of stuff you don't want, right? So while there's a lot of power to keyword search, it's certainly not the only thing out there. Meanwhile, while all of this travesty is going on, you are sitting next to the digitized litigation record that started when the complaint was filed in digital format and then encoded a huge amount of your context, the jurisdiction, the claims, the facts, right? And that litigation context grows and grows and grows. This huge source, this wealth of information about your context is just sitting next to you, right? Or your computer kind of sitting on a kind of folder aside from you. And so uh, really at heart, one of my sort of big efforts and my big sort of causes in life is to make sure that we couple our research tools directly to the context that surrounds us so that we can get intuitive results when we do do a keyword search, so that a very simple word like damages will bring back really intuitive results. And then as I was, we were sort of prototyping this, and this goes all the way back, uh, Roland and Mike, uh, Professor Janenserith were the first two people to kind of see this kind of happen. Uh, sometimes you don't need the keyword at all, right? So uh, I used to be able to say, this is a brief from the Uber litigation, but those guys are getting sued so much now that I have to say which one. This is the uh, litigation that the drivers brought to say that we should be employees, not independent contractors, and therefore uh, you guys owe us our gas money and benefits. Obviously Uber, you know, we'd prefer that that not be so, and so they hired a big law firm. This is a typical summary judgment motion. We haven't altered it in any way. We haven't done any metadata. It's uh, just 37 pages of encoded goodness, right? All right, so let's do some research. I have such a short amount of time, I should take advantage of this, but I want that like suspenseful. Like, the, the, <laughs> All right, so these are cases that are not in the brief itself. They're highly relevant to the brief, but they're not in the brief itself. Instead of saying, you come up with the six word query that you want, we said, give us the entire brief. And we'll leverage not just all of the text in the brief, but also that huge, fantastic citation graph. All those cases that you cite, we'll look at all the cases that, not only the cases that cite to those cases, but even cases that don't cite to them directly, but that appear next to them all the time, right? And this is something Shepherds and Keysight doesn't give you, right? With Shepherds and Keysight, it has to be a direct citation path. We also look at cases that are hanging out with your cases all the time, even if they're not uh, cited directly, right? So those are two things that you can do now once you start to pay attention to the litigation record and the context, right? And where we're heading next is when a brief is filed, we can pull that directly from the docket and send the attorney relevant case law before they've even read the brief yet, right? Now they should read the brief, they need to read the brief. This enhances, it does not replace attorneys. But uh, I see a world soon where the entire litigation system, this fantastic complex informatic system of every litigation that's going on, every filing that's happening, feeds directly into tools like this that then process that information and create reports for the attorney before they've even lifted a finger. Uh, and there's obvious benefits for pro se uh, litigants as well. Uh, although again, I want to build stuff that helps pro se people, but also helps the folks at Kirkland and Ellis, you know, where money's not an object. I think both, both people need help uh, and tools that uh, help both will lift all boats. That's my song and dance. My name is Pablo Arredondo. If you have any questions or if you'd like to come uh, check out headquarters in San Francisco, uh, let me know. Thank, Thank you. you.
Oh dear I. Let me see if I can move this a little bit. Hello everyone, my name is Kate Didich, and I just started my residential fellowship here at Codex. And a little bit of background about me, I'm an attorney and a city planner, which means because of the combination of those things, I think a lot about the regulations that govern cities and how they're used and how they're designed. Uh, and I think about this in part because I think also think a lot about how cities need to grow and adapt and develop uh, in the future for a variety of reasons, but uh, because of a rapidly urbanizing world population. So let me tell you a little bit about what that means. So right now we have about 7.6 billion people in the world and about a little over 50% live in cities. But in 33 years, by 2050, we'll have a total world population of 9.8 billion and 70% of those people will live in cities which means our cities need to accommodate an additional 2.8 billion people in the next 33 years. So what does that mean? It means we have to build a lot of housing. Um, these numbers indicate that, how much housing needs to be built perhaps a day. And another way to think about it is you need to build a city that will house a million people every five days between now and 2050, um, which is a bit daunting. Uh, we already see the impacts of having insufficient housing stock uh, in our cities. Uh, I just took this ad from Craigslist last week. Um, anyone who's looked for an apartment off campus uh, will feel the effects of insufficient housing firsthand. Uh, so these interests and concerns of mine led me a few years back to a startup named Flux, which spun out of Google X. Uh, and Flux had a has a mission to take existing design tools and make them better and faster and more efficient uh, in order to meet the world's demand for sustainable and durable buildings. Uh, my work focused on zoning ordinances uh, and how to make them more navigable and accessible and actionable. Uh, so I'll take a step back and explain what zoning regulations are. Uh, these are the regulations that tell you uh, how, how tall of a building you can build on your property. Uh, how far that building needs to be set back from the street, um, and also how that building can be used. Can it be a grocery store, or an apartment building, or a gas station? Uh, zoning ordinances uh, are incredibly complex. I was reading something today that referred to zoning regulations as opaque and mammoth, uh, which is not what you want out of regulations. Um, each municipality, or most municipalities, have them, so it can take a lot of time, uh, which we don't have, and a lot of expense to determine what are the applicable zoning regulations for a site you're interested in building. Does your proposal, your development proposal, does it have legs or is it dead on arrival? So I'm gonna take you through a little bit, just a short amount of the workflow that you have to go through in a lot of cities in America to determine what's the applicable zoning regulations. Uh, so let's say I was walking uh, downtown in Austin, which is one of our fastest growing cities uh, in the United States. Um, so I'm downtown, right across from the Capitol, near the governor's mansion, and I see this, this site. Um, and it's not the ideal uh, way to develop this site downtown. It's only two stories, there's a big surface parking lot. And so I wanna know, what can be done here? How can this site be improved upon? Austin does have a zoning profile tool where you can enter in an address of a of a site you're interested in, and it'll basically indicate uh, where you need to look in the zoning ordinances to get the answers you want. But it doesn't tell you specifically how these regulations apply to your particular property you're interested in. Uh, so let me show you what we built at Flux. This is the product I worked on, this is Metro. And if you just enter into the same address, it not only visualizes the applicable building envelope, it provides metrics for you. So what is your max height? How far must your building be set back from the street? Um, and if you click on those metrics, it links you to the applicable parts of the zoning code. So because you need to do your own due diligence. Um, so this, uh, 
Flux Metro also showed how your property can be used. Uh, this is the same slide. Oh. All right, try that again. All right, there we go. Um, so it also shows you how your property can be used. It lists the permitted uses, the prohibited uses, and allows you to run scenarios. So let's say I'm interested in building a single family home here. Uh, you can click on it and it will rerun the metrics for you. Um, so you'll see in a second, um, you can click on single family uh, home and your, uh, how you tell you can build that building gets affected drastically. So what next? Um, unfortunately, Flux Metro has been shelved, uh, which means there's a lot of opportunity to keep doing good work in this space. Um, there's still a definite need to make zoning regulations and the regulations that impact our cities easy to understand and take action upon. Um, so I'll be working on that while at CODES. Um, for instance, thinking about how accessory dwelling units, how we can surface those regulations more quickly so we can build more housing stock in stable single family neighborhoods. Um, so I'm just gonna conclude by saying if you have questions or are interested in cities and want to automate zoning regulations, please come talk to me, uh, feel free to email me. And uh, thank you. This is incredible. I, I just want to echo what Pablo said. To have a five, six levels deep to, to hear thinking and talking about legal tech and the community we have here is, is, is really heartening. Um, as someone who's been involved uh, here at Codex for the last seven years since I was a LLM student uh, in the Law, Science, and Technology program, um, we've watched this community grow and it's become more and more inclusive and uh, I want to just extend again the invitation to, to get involved. Um, I first got involved when I was uh, in my program. Uh, I'd been a lawyer for five years and I'd come to Stanford really to try and uh, um, democratize the things that I had learned. I was working in a big law firm and uh, a lot of the uh, clients that we had were very large corporate clients who spent a lot of money um, understanding the rules and being able to shape the rules to the things that they wanted to do. Um, but part of the promise of technology, I think, is to democratize uh, all sorts of things. And I was seeing my clients, my technology clients, doing that in various areas, and I was wondering, why isn't this happening in my area, in law? And so I found my community here at Codex during my year on my master's program. Um, thanks to Roland and, and, and Professor Genezra uh, for supporting that uh, inclusivity. And I worked on a few different Codex projects that were already in motion uh, during my year, and then I was supported in setting up my own project, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that, and it's called Legal.io. Um, the problem that we were addressing is, uh, it's the problem I mentioned. Clients who are looking to get access to legal help uh, generally go through their own networks. Uh, there's obviously, more recently, there's been a whole host of uh, marketplaces, and, and I'll touch on some of those, but it is time intensive, and individuals generally have limited reach, and they have limited data to go about that search. Um, in the last few years, there have been hundreds of uh, marketplaces and, and infrastructure organizations that have been set up to try and address this, this particular problem. We approached it slightly differently, though. We didn't want to create a centralized single brand. We wanted to create the infrastructure to enable any organization, any infrastructure organization uh, that was set up to try and match people who need help to their providers. Uh, we wanted to create a framework that all of them could use. And so Legal.io is essentially a technology infrastructure that enables all of these kinds of organizations to track uh, the intake of legal needs, uh, refer those uh, with a certain level of uh, automation, and then track outcomes. And then we have a model where those organizations are uh, certified and ethically allowed to uh, take a percentage fee 
uh, unlike many of these marketplaces, and that's a very interesting area of regulation that uh, uh, is currently very much in play in terms of who is allowed to quote unquote fee share uh, with lawyers because lawyers have an ethical duty to um, try and maintain the, 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 the best interests of the clients, whereas some of these uh, marketplaces may not. So we've been working with this quote unquote regulators who, are, who have this ethical duty and they are able to do that. And so we uh, are able to set in place this infrastructure for a lot of these different organizations. Um, uh, one of our largest implementations with New York State Bar, they have 72,000 members, and we're able to uh, uh, curate and bring in the data about those attorneys, uh, who trust them to do what, what they're capable of, what they have done, what has been referred to them before, and use that as part of that automated routing functionality we embed for them. Um, other, other bars just use it more as a search and directory uh, format, but uh, we're, there's various ways that we've been able to implement with different kinds of infrastructure level organizations like state bars. Uh, individual providers, professionals like you and me, uh, they're able to join many of these networks using the same individual profile. Um, and uh, ultimately from the uh, from a infrastructure organization's perspective, they're able to have all of this online, on mobile, get that intake data in, do that referral and gather those outcomes. Um, and essentially, this is something that we're seeing all across the economy. We're seeing, you know, quote unquote, sharing economy companies. I mean, Uber, Airbnb, they, they sort of took on this portmanteau of sharing economy. And really, they are trying to create this sharing and value creation. Um, but the difference is that they have a situation where sort of one driver is replaceable by another driver. And, and really, that isn't the case in law. One lawyer is very different from another lawyer. And um, lawyers also play a slightly different role, I think, in, uh, in the economy and society. We, we as lawyers, you know, speaking to what Brian was talking about, we're somewhat there to try and draw the lines of, uh, you know, the moral limits of what markets can or can't do. But at the same time, this kind of approach is, uh, you know, the reason it's going across all across the economy is because it is more lucrative. I mean, a lot of these network orchestrator companies uh, have hit upon something, and that's that they're able to extract more value. Um, the question is how much value is right to extract for each of these network orchestrators. So right now we're working with a whole bunch of different uh, uh, kinds of organizations. We started off working with uh, a lot of uh, uh, actually early stage infrastructure organizations. They're, they're variously called uh, legal incubators. And the great thing about these infrastructure organizations is they, they at one and the same time provide that intake referral and outcome to their network of, uh, of participants. But these participants are actually new lawyers. They're, they're coming out of law school and they're setting up their own practices to try and serve local community individuals. And they're being trained in how to do that by these, by these incubators. Uh, from there, we started working with more and more bar associations uh, and various other organizations that, uh, and, and, and this one here, we're, 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 we're pretty excited by because uh, Twitch isn't a legal organization. Uh, they're a platform that got bought for a billion dollars by Amazon a few years back, and they provide uh, sort of live broadcasting services. But they have a user base of over a million broadcasters, and uh, we're now working with them to channel all the legal needs of those users uh, through our system, working with some of our partners, uh, to get legal help. And so taking legal services and trying to integrate them into the ways in which people are actually going about their daily business is uh, part and parcel of all of this as well. Um, in terms of uh, the team I was lucky to find in, oh, I was lucky to find uh, uh, a couple of fantastic co-founders to, to get this going. Uh, Peter was on my course, uh, the LLM as well. And Daniel, we found through our, a startup accelerator that I helped set up called Stardex. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've just been continuing to build out. We've got a team of 12 people now. Um, and it's uh, in no small part thanks to Codex. Um, talking a little bit more about Codex just briefly, and, and, and obviously Ronan's touched on this, but uh, a big part of the reason why Codex is important is I think this is, by and large, the, the broader uh, position that a lot of people generally have about lawyers in the legal profession. And so uh, this is currently the autocorrect if you put this into Google. Um, I'll skip over this, but, uh, but again, I think by working with the kinds of organizations that are trying to have impact uh, in local communities and local societies, and I speak again to the notion of legal incubators, uh, entrepreneurs who are going into the legal space and are trying to create these alternative delivery models. Uh, this happens to be a map of like, the legal incubators all across the country that we uh, will be working with, thanks to a couple of gents here in the audience as well. But uh, I mean, these are the sorts of different approaches to getting more legal services to the places where, where they're needed. Um, and we're, we're working specifically uh, with some support from the Kaufman Foundation on a, 
uh, on a project that's about measuring outcomes and the impact of legal services uh, from a network perspective. And how do you take the best practices that one organization or orchestrator has used, for example, using flat fee services or using more paralegals, plugging that in and, and creating standards around that. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, I, I won't spend too much time going into that. But, uh, but again, at the end of the day, this is about being part of a larger network. Um, if you have a firm, the idea is that you can plug yourself into all of these different sources of work and connection uh, in order to increase your impact. And hopefully, at the end of the day, 10 years time when we're done, it will be more something like this. So uh, um, if you're interested, please get in touch. Uh, I'd love to talk to anybody who's interested in legal innovation more generally. Um, but uh, um, thanks again to Kodak. Thank you all for your time. Why not? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Abhijit. Uh, I'm a CS PhD student here, and my advisor is Mike. I'm going to be talking about a project uh, in the CS department, uh, which has flourished thanks to the help from Codex and its partners. And this project is uh, worksheets. So let's start with what really is a worksheet. So worksheets are, oops, that's weird. Yeah, it's a PDF. Yeah, it's a Sorry about that. That's the usual problems with that. I'm just going to present from my browser. <laughs> yeah. OK. So worksheets are essentially dynamic active forms. A prototypical example of what a worksheet is is what TurboTax is. So TurboTax is basically, it has made a problem of filing taxes, which is extremely unpleasant. It has made, made it relatively tolerable. So typically, a worksheet is something where there is some actionable law that is brought closer to the point of user interaction. In TurboTax, it is basically embodies a, a fraction of the tax code. And as the user interacts with the application, the TurboTax is, I mean, the tax code is, the cranks are turned, and the amount owed or your refund amount is shown to you. Not just in TurboTax, there are many other applications within the legal domain. To where, which are examples of worksheets. So typically, worksheets can be used in the domain of privacy and security. They could be used to sort of manage uh, compliance with uh, labor laws. It could be ma managed to sort of regulate uh, imports and exports and so forth. Even when you sort of, so, but this idea of a dynamic app, the idea of a actionable app where law is being evaluated, this is not something specific to the legal domain alone. You can have worksheets that are applicable to, let's say, physics, let's say, academics. You can use worksheets to build puzzles, build games, build process simulations, and so forth. 
In fact, let me give you an example of a worksheet that's currently being used at Stanford. And that is in the domain of academic program management. So this application is actually a program sheet. And I'm, since this PDF is non-interactable, I need to open this link again. Sorry about that. So this is an extremely sort of toned down version of a program sheet. So let me just give you a back, quick background of what a program sheet is. A program sheet is essentially a student's contract, student's contract with the uh, university. And basically, a student has to satisfy some academic regulations before he and she can graduate. So in this case, you can see that in a program sheet, there are a list of courses. Uh, there are some requirements highlighted at the top. The requirements that are not met are highlighted in red. And I start interacting with this program sheet. You will note that some requirements that were previously unsatisfied, which were in red, now turn black. And the others, which were previously satisfied, now turn red. So this is an ex extremely small example of a worksheet, of what a, what a potential of a, what a worksheet could be. So, so all this is nice and fine. So this concept of a dynamic app has existed. So, but why hasn't these worksheets taken over the world? The problem is that to create one of these worksheets, it's a huge, tedious process. You have to be familiar and expert at a huge stack of technologies, starting from the front end to the back end. And this is not do and the cost of development is extremely high. So what our philosophy is, and what we have tried to do in this project, is basically make this process extremely streamlined and make it do it yourself in the process for developers and non-developers alike. And our idea is to make the development of these dynamic apps, of these worksheets, as simple as setting up a spreadsheet. Just as, as you'd use, math use mathematical formulas to set up a spreadsheet, similarly, you'd use simple logical formulas to describe the model of your app. And that's it. You don't need to know what a database is. You don't need to know what, uh, how to build the UI and so forth. That's all streamlined for you. To validate our approach, by the way, th the magic that makes it all possible is called dynamic logic programming. And that is something that has grown out of our research in our group. To evaluate our model, what we've done is we've set up a platform which is publicly accessible, freely accessible, worksheet.sanford.edu. You can go in, sign in, and start creating worksheets. And this platform allows you to log in. No installation needed, because that's one of my pet peeves. You can log in, start creating apps, start testing them, start deploying them. And not only can you create standalone apps, but you can create apps that talk to each other apps that share messages, apps that share a common data set. You can set up workflows. You can set up microservices and whatnot. So the potentials are immense for you. To give you an example of some of our deployments, wrapping up. All right. In that case, what I would like you to do is, so by the way, just wanted to mention that there has been a legal informatics class where our platform has been used to create legal worksheets. These are your colleagues. So if you have a cool idea, you want to make it happen, just contact me. My email is abhijit at cs.sanford.edu. Reach out to me, and we'll make a difference. Thank you. So closing us out will be uh, Jay Mandel. Hey, it's, uh, it's really humbling to be uh, speaking in front of you today. Um, my peers are amazing entrepreneurs, as you can tell, either as uh, practitioners or as students. Um, so I'll be closing up for today. I'd like to talk a little about, um, I'm a fellow here at Codex. Um, I'd like to talk a little about a, a course that we're offering in spring quarter. It's a mini class called the Startup Bootcamp for Lawyers. And so what this course is, this is sponsored by Codex, and we have 25 law students who joined. This is our second year doing this. So the idea behind this is basically to provide a product and design crash course for law students as to how to build companies from scratch. So we take you through the process of designing um, ideas, designing products, going through the product prioritization process, building actual business cases, and then at the end of this course, 
doing a, a pitch in front of three or four actively investing VCs from Silicon Valley. So it's pretty exciting. Um, it's our second year doing the course. Um, and uh, I think it addresses, like the question is, why would we offer this course? So the, the, the thrust of it is that I think there is, and this is discussions I've had with Roland for many years, the idea is that I think there's a gap in the, in the law school educational curriculum to prepare you to not only start companies, but better represent your clients if you become law firm, big law firm attorneys or small law firm attorneys or even become in-house counsel. And I think um, what I'll talk to you and, and share with you kind of anecdotally from my example, where this gap comes into play as you play out your career, kind of taking you through the arc of my shortfalls, my sort of failings in my career um, over, the ca over the course of the past 20 years. So I spent about seven years as a big law firm attorney, which many of you may become, and I, and I know that many of the companies like Intel or, or Google or others definitely took my advice, but they didn't respect my sort of uh, thinking when it came to product and advising them on the business. This became more pronounced when I became the head at Apple. I was the head mergers and acquisitions attorney. So I was working very closely with the top executives, jobs executives at a time when we just lo launched the iPhone and the iPad. Now, the thing was, I was trusted in M&A to actually advise them on what companies to buy, help them think through these issues. And I felt woefully unprepared <laughs> to actually address these issues because I didn't think I had the training in law school or you know, before to actually be able to address these issues. So that was something I really had to catch up on. And then if you're thinking about being entrepreneurial, I went on to start a company called Law Pivot, a confidential Q&A company. One of my team members, Benton, is actually here. And there, I had to learn from scratch how to become a product leader and design leader and actually lead a team of engineers to do this on my own. That was quite daunting. That's something that we didn't learn in law school. And then lastly, my job basically as a co-founder of this company, and you may be in this situation, was to develop the business case and pitch my ID in front of VCs. So I think I pretty much uh, did a pretty bad job there <laughs> because I went in front of 40 different VCs up and down Sand Hill Road in front of angels and all of them said no. This is quite stressful to me because they were all, all my team members were housed in my house for a year with no pay and they were threatening to basically leave my startup. And my job, my one job was to raise the money. So I think, you know, clearly we could have had some, I could have had some training in a law school environment to understand what it takes to actually do this. Now, there's a silver lining to this whole story. We eventually got funded by Sequoia Capital and Google Ventures and Apple executives and Google executives. So it, it worked out okay for us. <laughs> but it definitely was a very hard road of four or five months of not knowing exactly what we needed to do. So I think these stories all bring to the fore that we think we need some class like this. And this is just the beginning to whet your appetite. And I see a couple of students from our last class over here, from our last class, um, to give you a taste over course of a week and, and, and focused over the weekend of what it takes to design something, to actually develop the products, to actually negotiate, and how to build these, um, these pitches to VCs. Now, we're really proud to say we had about 25 law students, five teams that developed um, ideas in the areas, not just in the areas of legal tech, but also virtual reality, um, in the areas of, of health and fitness, in the areas of IoT, and they pitched to these three VCs. And the thing I'm really proud of these students is that one of the VCs walked away and said, you know what, I think these students, even though it was a week, had probably spent, it seemed like they spent a month or, or a couple of months actually developing these ideas and pitching them. So we clearly have the horsepower here at Stanford <laughs> to develop great ideas. And a lot of the people who are around the room were actually mentors that you'll actually interact with. Um, Roland and, and the others here, we're really proud to say we also um, had a really diverse student body. Half of our students were women, which we're really proud of. Um, and we had really focused on getting women and minorities as some of our mentors and some of our, our actual instructors during the course. So the upshot is that, um, again, this is our attempt to whet your appetite at the start of Bootcamp for Lawyers as a way to understand the world of, of actually not only building companies, but representing companies as a big law firm attorney and also as an in-house counsel. Um, it'll be um, the week of April 2nd, April 7th, 8th will be the, uh, the actual uh, the, the intense part of the boot camp, and, uh, and we'll be sending more information. You could actually uh, email me at j.mundle at sap.com if you're interested in, in signing up beforehand, but we'll tell you beforehand, like a, a couple of weeks beforehand, if you want to sign up for the course. So that's like the upshot. Really excited to be involved in that. I think we're down to, uh, it's about two o'clock now. I'd just like to wrap up for everyone, because I, sorry, do you want, do you want to wrap up? Um, I want to wrap up, and if there are questions, I'll take them afterwards.
I want to wrap up just on behalf of Roland and Susan and, and the full team that's over here. That we are very excited to see this full room of people. Like Pablo and, and, uh, and, uh, and folks said, literally it was me, Roland, Pablo, and five others in a room who were giving speeches to each other like eight years ago. And so to actually have an audience to, for people who actually listen to us <laughs> is, <laughs> is something that's very different. We're excited by, by legal tech and the development, and you see a lot of companies raising, raising money from places like Sequoia and Google Ventures and other places. And, and Pablo has been kind of a forerunner in terms of raising tens of millions of dollars for his company. Um, but I think this is just the, the power, I, I think, of, of legal tech and how we've really succeeded as, as a center that started off with 10 people and now has become a full group here and also people worldwide coming to our future law conference in April as being the premier legal tech conference in the world. So hats off to, uh, to Codex. And again, we're all humbled. Please feel, feel free to reach out to us and feel free to ask us any questions. Thank you again.